Okay, now there is one and only one piece of bad news, which is what Barry Harris is sitting in an airplane That's waiting strange. to get off the ground. <laughs> and Los Angeles. may or may no, not arise huh? in time for okay, part of this okay. event. The good news is that that means you're going to hear even more from these people here. <laughs> <laughs> and these people are special. In the center there is Ellen Adler. Uh, Amy, are you waving at me? Just yeah, I have. Oh, that's right. You're saying something first. <laughs> Ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. It's all right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's like you guys know already. Hi, I'm Amy Von Vett. I'm the Executive Assistant to Business Affairs, filling in for Terry today. Um, I'd like to, to welcome you to our first DG Academy of 2013. We're so happy to co-host this event with Harborwood. This is our third event together, and they've all been a really huge success, so thank you so much for that. As always, if there are any speakers or events you're interested in, feel free to email Terry at any time. Um, and at this time, I'd like to remind everybody to please turn off your cell phones and any other electronics. Um, and without further ado, here is Spence Porter, Dramatist Guild member and head of the New York chapter of Harvard. Okay. <laughs> and don't I look oddly familiar? <laughs> and, and thank you to the Dramatist Guild. I just love doing these joint events here. And so let me give you a quick outline of the sequence of events for this evening. We're going to start with about 40, 45 minutes of, of talk. And then we're going to have about 15 minutes of questions from you guys. And then we're going to have half an hour of video of the real, authentic Stella Adler. And so you definitely want to stick around for the end. <laughs> and in the center is Ellen Adler, Stella Adler's daughter, a painter of considerable distinction in her own right, and a member of the board of the Stella Adler studio. And over here is one of my favorite people, Vicki Wilson. Vicki is a very impressive lady. Yes. <laughs> She's uh, 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 vice president and senior editor at Knopf, where she was the editor in charge of this book. She's also an author. She has a book coming out, I think, in the fall about, this is going to be volume one of her two-volume biography of Barbara Stanwyck. Oh, and, <laughs> and I think that's going to be wonderful. And, and Vicki is distinguished in so many ways, I'm just not going to bother. Just take my word for it, <laughs> because it's, it's too much time when it's a panel. Yes. <laughs> and, really, I could go on about it. <laughs> and our moderator is another of my favorite people, Foster Hirsch. I've used him as a moderator many, many times. and and. He's just wonderful. He's a professor of film at Brooklyn College. He's the author of 16 books. Oh, I was a little more about Vicki. OK. As an editor, she's worked with people like Arthur Lawrence and Christopher Plummer and Sapphire and Anne Rice. I mean, big deal, big deal. And Foster's the author of 16 books. Thank you for the props, Kathy. <laughs> Foster. I warned them, the introduction was going to be whatever came out of my mouth. <laughs> and Foster is the author of 16 books, including the classic study of film noir, The Dark Side of the Screen, and most recently, a biography of Otto Preminger. So I'm looking forward to this. Thank you all for Thank speaking. You. Thank you for coming. Let's welcome. <clears throat> Actually, I want to start first because we are talking about a book tonight, Stella Adler on um, American Playwrights. So I want to talk first with the publisher of the book, Vicki. What was your inspiration for publishing this book? And it is volume two that we, we have before us now. First of all, I'd like to <clears throat> thank everybody for coming out. 
on this very <clears throat> balmy weather <laughs> and uh, braving the cold. The inspiration was Stella herself. Um, I had taken classes with her. I had audited classes and it really in many ways changed my life. And one night we were having dinner and I asked her about publishing some of her lectures. And she said, well, go into the hall closet and uh, open the door. And instead of coats, there were shelves of all of her lectures in notebooks from Aeschylus to Arthur Miller. And I suggested that we do two volumes, the first on Ibsen, Strindberg, and Chekhov on the European masters. <coughs> and the second on the American Masters. And the great gift was that she had agreed, she agreed to do it. Um, many people had, been, had asked her to, if they could publish her lectures, and she had always put them off. And, but, you know, family was important to Stella, and she agreed. I think what Spence left out is tonight, this is really special, Ellen is Stella's daughter, but Vicki is Stella's stepdaughter. stepdaughter. And my sister is here, and she's a stepdaughter. Erica. <laughs> Erica. Yes. So we're hearing about yeah. Stella from within the family. Indeed. So she wouldn't say no to you. Well, she, she may have, but I think that we had developed a very interesting, close relationship, a very interesting, close relationship, and I, you know, uh, reconnected with Stella as a result of Ellen. I think we ran into each other on the subway or something, and Ellen said, come for dinner. And um, when our, our father had died, Stella was uh, very suddenly of a heart attack. He was much younger than she was. And um, she was basically not great after she was, well, she was not great, but she was also not great to us. And um, children. at the children, and so I hadn't seen or heard from her, nor did I want to, for many years. And then I was thinking of um, writing a biography of Alla Nazimova, and I went and interviewed her about Nazimova. And um, there, I don't know, there had been a past between them. I'm not sure what it was because there was some kind of edge, probably because Nazimova brought Chekhov and Ibsen to this country. And uh, anyway, um, it, uh, you know, it, I was then publishing the letters of Tennessee Williams uh, to Maria St. Just. And I went to see Stella and I said, could I take the classes, your classes, your master classes on Tennessee Williams? And she said, of course, darling. And um, so I went and showed up and she walked in and everybody stood up. The queen <laughs> has arrived and she proceeded to talk and it completely, I was shocked and stunned and amazed and it was like a religious experience. And she very well may be the greatest teacher of acting of the 20th century. But she also, as this book proves, was a great interpreter of plays. Well, what she really was, more than anything else, was a great, great thinker. Mm -hmm. And she really ta was talking about art, about life, about, <coughs> about thinking about understanding about how to move ahead, about really how to think. And she was talking in a way that nobody else talked. I'd never heard any, nobody was talking that way, nobody thought that way, and I thought, I have to be here to hear this. And it's, you know, it is an interesting story because the time of my childhood when I met her and, you know, I could not understand it, let's put it this way, it was, it was slightly <laughs> unhinging. And um, the Cupids were everywhere, and my father, who was a very elegant man, but who was actually quite simple in his, in his affect and what surrounded him, was suddenly, you know, cloaked in, you know, gold. <laughs> and um, 
I basically, it was like, who are you and where are you and where am I and what has happened? And long after, all those years later, I realized that this was, in a way, a legacy. And that it was my, that I had received this huge gift from this woman, uh, as monstrous as she was when I was a child. And I had received this huge gift, and it was my honor and obligation to to bring to bring this to uh, fruition. And what's amazing about the book is her voice comes through, because there's one thing to hear the voice, and there's another thing to read the voice. They're two very different things. But Barry's editing is so skillful that I kept hearing her as I was reading the book. Well, what he did, and I wish he was here, but yeah. you know, just let's all uh, send Barry some white light because he's on a tarmac waiting to be de-iced, which he's been for two hours. Jesus. And um, <clears throat> what he did was he took, I mean, these were not, um, you know, narrative essays that be had a beginning and a middle and an end. They were notes thousands of drafts of notes that were taken together, that were put together, and then were taken apart and made into a narrative essay. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, managing to hold on to that, to to that voice. The unique voice and the unique point of view. Right. Now, Ellen, uh, Vicki, very, I'm so grateful for your candor, was talking about Stella being somewhat deficient as a mother when you were a kid. No, no. But is that, what no, no, was no. your experience of her as my, a mother? My experience of Stella as a mother, I had difficulty when when she thought, when I got older because she was a, a very prominent person and, and you couldn't get through uh, as the years went on. Can you hear? On, as no, the years no, went no. on. Can you hear? No. No. All right. Can you hear this? Can you hear this? Is this, thing, is this on? No, no. Okay. No, no. Are the mics on? They're for the live stream, they're not for in the room. Oh, oh all right. I hear you. You hear me, sir. Okay, so for in the room, we're just talking loud. All right, Ellen, okay. you have to speak up. Have to all speak right, up. my mother, uh, my mother, my grandfather, Jacob Adler, was one of the great Yiddish actors uh, that ever lived. I mean, he's even, he's even mentioned in Kafka. Uh, and he had, uh, and my grandmother was a very, very extraordinary actress. They both were from Russia, from the U Ukraine. And they uh, played on the on the Lower East Side. Jacob was part of the Haskalah in the sense that he brought plays into the Yiddish theater that came from the outside world. So he, his idea was to educate the Jews <clears throat> and let them be a part of the West. But he was a very great actor, and the family, everybody in the family was in the theater. I'm the only one that didn't go into the theater, and I think it's because my mother was so as they say, awesome, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't do it. Because I remember with uh, uh, Berg, Berg, Bergner, Elizabeth Bergner, this mm -hmm. great German actress. And Stella was in a play with her. She took a small part because she wanted to see how this woman worked because she was a giant. She came out of Mount Reinhardt Theater. And she asked me to come in her dressing room and, and talk to her. Now this was the great, great actress, and I was sitting with her, and as I was sitting there, I thought, if my mother were more like this, I could have been an actress, but she was a big show off, I mean, and she was gorgeous. I mean, she was absolutely extraordinary, and very public. She would walk down the street when she'd come to Paris, we were people sitting in the De Margaux, and they, she had great clothes, and she, and everybody would yell, chapeau, chapeau, bravo. And so uh, she, she was something extraordinary. But I was the only child in a family. All the other people in the family had stayed in the Yiddish theater. And Stella, I have to say that she was a very, very brave woman. Because in those days, to go out on your own in any way at that time was, was really extraordinary. Anyway. My grand, we were in the, there. She was in, in the Yiddish theater, and then she said, then she found out that there were uh, Boloslavsky, who had worked with Stanislavsky, was giving classes, and she went to Boloslavsky and and worked with him in, in this other thing because the Yiddish theater had one one way. She had worked. Uh, she was in the group theater with Lee Strasberg, but she denounced him altogether because Lee felt that you should use yourself 
and your experience and your feelings and bring that to the role. And that's how you could get the emotion. And she said, that's just too small. You're not interesting enough. You can't get the emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? So she worked, then she worked with Stanislavski in, 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 in uh, Paris. She met Stanislavski and she worked with him. And of course, everybody knows that the greatest part of art comes out of the artist's imagination. And Stanislavski trained her to use her imagination on these parts. And so she then discovered how to create an environment for these people where, they, where the te desk was, where the thing was, where everything, to make a surrounding and to go into the character in a much larger way than Mr. Strasberg had asked. Anyway, they remained enemies till the end. <laughs> when, when I told Vicky, when he died, she said to her class, an important man in the American, we will have a moment of silence, an important man in the American theater has died. And then at the end she said, it will take the American theater 100 years to get over his rotten influence. <laughs> Actually, I was in the class you that day. Yeah. I was there that day. It is the truth. It yeah, is the truth. Uh, uh, the, the class gasped yeah. when she said it. Yeah, because they gasped. And the thing about Lee that made him different from Stella and from my stepfather, Stella was married to Harold Clerman, and he started the group theater, and they they were enormously idealistic, and they did 10 years of work, working on technique, working on speech, working. And mainly the playwright that came out of that was Clifford Odets, and they did those parts. So, uh, so she, she had worked on that. And Lee, of course, said, you have to use yourself. Then she gave the speech. She said, you know, you're, you're just too small. You're not big enough. You have to go. And I think every artist and anybody studying art knows that the whole thing that moves the world forward is the imagination. Einstein, whoever it was, brings it further out, further out from the me. So she changed the acting, teaching. She only started teaching because she had been an actress, and then she joined the group theater, and that was from 1929 to 1939, and then that was, you know, that fell apart. And everybody, I have to tell you then, everybody was poor. My mother was poor. Every everybody has everybody was broke. We lived in an apartment on 58th Street with a big, long, beautiful table like this, the dining table, and that was from the house of Connolly, <laughs> a play box. stage, uh, yeah, Prop. and everything. <laughs> and uh, and then she met Harold Clerman, and he was starting the Group Theater, which was a very extraordinary adventure. That they, what did you say? most important yeah. experiment in the history of American theater. Yes, and Foster wrote this wonderful thing, and, and they took the bus, and they, say that line. They took the bus on 40-something Street, this group of actors, and changed, and changed the American theater. And changed the American yeah, theater, yeah. yeah. That one ride to the country yeah. changed the theater. The thing uh, is about Stella is that to the end, she was a student. She was always, always studying. She had the books on the bed, and she was studying, and she went to study at Columbia, to study with Maya Shapiro about painting, and she studied, and she went to Europe, and she looked at everything. She studied all her life. Self-educated, not yeah. formally educated. No, no. But the people who she surrounded herself with, Harold and everything, they, I mean, they were very, people, people read, people were really engaged in those days, very, very much so. But Ellen, we want to know. We know your mother was very flamboyant in class, very theatrical. What was she like as a mother? <laughs> she flamboyant was flamboyant and theatrical. No, when I was little, uh, she sent me away a lot. I went away to boarding school when I was three years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she was in this, and she at that time she was still in the Yiddish theater, and she had to go down to South America with the. Uh, Schwartz and, and, and the Yiddish Theater. And I was away a great deal, so that was the thing. So being home was extraordinary. And the family were all actors, most of them still in the Yiddish Theater. And the house was filled with actors. And there are no better people in the world. Actors are fun, and they're nice, and they're generous. And, they're since, and I've been with a lot of different people, including many years spent in Paris with 12-tone composers, so Schoenberg. And th there's nothing nicer and more generous than a group of actors to grow up with. So the whole family, everybody in the family were actors. 
and we had fun. We had fun sitting and talking. And then but, she, but she sent you away to boarding school at three. <laughs> Was she an attentive mother, even so? I remember she came back and she did this thing. I told this to a therapist many years later, and this is, this is, this is, this is what he did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she came back, and I was in this little boarding school in Brooklyn, and she came Is there in. a boarding school in Brooklyn? There was, it was run by somebody from the Yiddish Theater, oh. the, the woman. Zhidlovsky was the name. How's that for a name? And uh, I was the youngest. I was three, and the rest of them were all six years old. And Stella came. But what she did, this is what the analyst went, uh, is that she hid. So she, you know, she saw me and she hid. She was a very good mother. We got along. Why did I, she hide? I don't understand. To be playful. Oh, oh. She was a very, a very good mother. In the end, I found that there was just it was. I found it to be heavy. I just I couldn't lift lift it up to where we'd been when she was young. I, I don't know why that was. She just, she talked about the theater and she was serious. If anybody had been with her, they would not, not have gone into the theater because the theater became this thing that was so serious. But she was a, an intellectual giant and she had two things. She was probably one of the most beautiful women of her time. And she had these brains and they were big. And Vicki has the book and everything. And she had this thing, so she wanted two things to go at once. She wanted you to know that she was beautiful and she was very flamboyant. And then she wanted you to know that she was very intelligent. So, yeah, I, did, I, did I tell her about that? Anyway, uh, so, and she was very extremely, so her breakdown in plays and all that is absolutely, there's a French expression, son par agile. And did you see her? As, as she was teaching, did you go to class? Were you welcomed in class? Did she encourage I you to go, go to class? I didn't go a lot because it would be too hard to make the relationship between her as a mother and then see this, this thing go on. I went, but I didn't go as much. And, and she noticed that, that I didn't go as much. I couldn't. That's, that, isn't that an interesting point? That you, the, the, the relationship between Stella and Oh my class God, he's a writer. Are your arms de-iced? Is that bad? That's Barry Paris. Come up here, Barry. Barry, great. great. So back to introductions. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you move to the end? I'll move to the end. Yeah. 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 And no. Barry Paris. Barry, why don't you take this? Compiled, as you've heard, this wonderful book. He's the author of biographies oh, of oh, Greta Garbo, Audrey Hepburn, Louise Brooks, and the co-author of Tony Curtis's autobiography, and has heroically arrived <laughs> in spite of sleet and ice on the runway, etc. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Done better than a hitchhike from Pittsburgh, but uh, I think I should mention the point that Vicky and I were making, and I was just reminded of it in looking at the book again today because I had the privilege of going to Stella's classes and hearing that unique voice and that unique presence, and what you were able to do in editing the lectures was to communicate a sense of of her of her particular voice. I heard her in that, and I know it took a lot of work. Tell us about your process. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a, a high compliment. Uh, it was hard. It is not hard. It is impossible to replicate Stella Adler's voice. There is only one <laughs> Stella Adler voice. Uh, but what I did actually, thank God, Vicki uh, nudged me to go and meet her and spend at least a little bit of time that we did have together. She she and I in California, oh. so that I was oh, able to, uh -huh. yeah, it was, it was um, sadly brief, but it was uh, several days that were fascinating, of mm -hmm. course, for me, and she uh, was extraordinary, even though uh, she was, uh, you know, very old, she was 90, um, but very sharp. Anyway, that voice, and of course I had my tape recorder, uh, stayed with me forever. And uh, what I tried to do, actually, I think if I had any secret at all, and of course Victoria handed me about 3,000 pages of 
transcribed lectures and said, please turn this into two books. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Sunny side up. Yes, sunny side up. And it only took about 13 years. But anyway, um, what I did was, was I was trying to amalgamate everything, consolidate, coordinate it, uh, was I would uh, speak the words out loud when I wasn't sure whether or not they worked or not. I, it was an old trick, actually, I learned in interviewing people years ago and doing, trying to write articles that sounded like the person I had interviewed. So I knew what her voice sounded like. I didn't know it as well as a student or as relative, but I knew it. And anyway, I would just speak things out loud. The trouble was that her whole style was so, um, you know, her pedagogical style was very different from her conversational style, and it involved a lot of repetition, which good pedagogues do anyway, or at least many do, but you can't do too much of it, especially in print. And these wonderful transcripts were not prose. They were transcribed words, and, and repetition was pretty massive after a while. I mean, I would find five lectures on um, a certain scene or two from, say, uh, Glass Menagerie, or uh, in the first volume was special. A Glass Menagerie, she was particularly brilliant about it. Well, that was my great actress. Ah, yes, well, Lorette. Lorette Taylor. Uh, but, and these five lectures would be similar, let's say, uh, but there was always something different, or a few things different. So anyway, I was trying to pick and choose things. But I think the, uh, if there was any, there were, my favorite moments were discovery moments of, uh, you know, we needed to have, and we decided we'd have, of course, Glass Menagerie and, uh, Vicki and I, that is, decided we would have Glass Menagerie and, and Streetcar and Summer and Smoke. Just speaking about Tennessee Williams, but we discovered the Lady of Larkspur Lotion. <laughs> which is the most bizarre, extraordinary one-act play that nobody knows. And so that was a lot of fun to think that we were resurrecting that for people who generally didn't know it, as her students certainly didn't, that play. It makes, uh, that play makes Orpheus descending look like national velvet. I don't know, it's, <laughs> it is just, Beyond, beyond the, the, the uh, Barry, what I <coughs> noticed in the book, there's just a little of it, but if you were in Stella's classes, there was an extraordinary call and response. It was almost like a religious ceremony oh, yes. between her and the students. Absolutely. And there's a little bit of it in the book, but did you not include more because it wouldn't have reproduced what it was <laughs> it actually like to be there? It's hard to translate. You're absolutely right, though. I'm so glad you mentioned it, because that is, that's a good way to describe it. Coral, I, I thought of it as the, you know, remember from Plato, Glaucon and, um, is it Socrates or Plato? Anyway, it's, you know, Glaucon, the student's job is to say, Yes, sir. You know, do you agree? Yes, sir. I agree. You know, well, is, I, that, is that not right? Yes, you sir. know, I was in, cl in class where she would say, I think she did this very early on, that she would talk and she would say, I want you to respond to me. I'm not just talk. You have yeah. to be present. And, so, yeah, and, the, yeah. and you will see in the clips that I put together, she'll say, yes, do you agree? And they'll say, yes. <laughs> yes. Or <laughs> you'll, you'll see that repeatedly. Yeah. She, yeah. she wants to she know She demanded that a response. Yes, she, she insisted that, that she you. She insisted. Yeah. She would say, who know, who agreed, or uh, who understands? Right, who <laughs> right. understands. And the, uh, if you obviously, it's, <laughs> who, but, who but, you do, but you do include a, an unforgettable line when mm -hmm. there was an argument between her and Kira Sedgwick, and Stella says, oh, "Who do you think is going to win this argument?" <laughs> <laughs> that is. I mean, it wasn't moment. exactly equality between her and no, her students. No, and Kira Sedgwick was a little bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I that mean, about it. studying, studying. She, she really, she couldn't take that heaviness and, and the seriousness. Of it, you know. She's married to Kevin Bacon? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> come up. She uh, took, you know, when she wanted to be, she could be Stella, could be a little on the mean side. Oh, yeah. She was hard. I'm sure I don't need to tell. She was hard. She wasn't hard with me, but she was hard. And there was she wasn't people. hard with you, Ella? 
No, she was not hard with me. She was afraid of me. She was afraid of you. She indicates that at, at a number of points, including a couple of quotes yes. in the book where okay. she says, my daughter, you know, says I'm a fool. She says I'm, you know, she gets away with it. She, she says I'm a fool. I don't she, understand. She, she, was, she was not easy uh, a, a lot of the time. As she got older, she got less easy. When she was young, she was playful. And when she was in the group, they were young and, and idealistic. I have to say that she was always studying. My mother was a student from the day she was born. And she studied, well, she studied acting, and she, she went to Boleslavsky. She went and met Stanislavski in Paris and worked with him. She, did I tell this? Yes. She had been in the group theater. She had been in the Yiddish theater, and she was a completely, when they started the group theater, she was a completely developed actress. She'd been in the Yiddish theater since she was three. And it was Jacob Adler, and they did all the plays. And then came Lee Strasberg, who was all coming from the inside and everything. And so she then got very, very uh, serious about finding the imagination, find, finding in the play, go, try, use your imagination. Don't decide what it's going to be. Use your imagination, and you then will be part of the playwright. You will, uh, you will. So, subsidize what he hasn't put in. So, so, uh, so she did develop that, and she tried to do that with with all of the students. She was not a teacher in the beginning. She started teaching uh, in because uh, in 1939 there was, you know, the depression, and she got a job at the new school teaching, and that was the beginning. And of course, she had some very Brando was in that class. And she had some other very, very good students. But teaching that she became a, a giant, that was what and then that was she started out. She started really as an actress looking for looking but I, parts. But Ellen, is it possible, because I felt this when I was in her classes, that she wasn't acting on the stage, yeah. but she was acting she in her that. classes. Yeah, yeah. And that her, so. her teaching <clears throat> was, those were some of the greatest performances mm -hmm. being given in New York. Nobody knew it but her students, but it was as great as any performance you would have seen she on was Broadway. She very fluid. Lee said, you know, she denounced Lee Strasberg all the time. She, she never finished denouncing Lee Strasberg, but uh, he said she's very fluid, and she had a, a complete ability to, ha to be in that and then be moved, and then the tears were there, and then she was in the scene, and she didn't have to work to do that. That was something that came. And he, and Lee said she's very fluid. She, she just can be in the character at the moment. And you could see that when she told a story. If she just did, just told a story about something that was happening that she was in the theater. But, but is, it, is it fair to say her greatest role was as a teacher? Yes. That, and once she became this great yeah. teacher, there were no more performances on stage. Well, they were. She didn't get. She didn't have the career she wanted. A, she was Jewish. That was when America was far more anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic than than ever, you know. That that was after the war. That was over. But she had to change her name, and and then she didn't get parts. And the fights in the house between Harold Florin and my mother about her career and what he was trying to do, and she was in the group theater, and they were terrible fights. They really fought. And finally, at one point, she went to the new school, and she worked with Piscator, who was a German director, and, and very uh, uh, simple. And another thing about Stella is that she studied all the time. She studied out with Bertolt Brecht, in, 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 he was in California. She studied with Stanislavski. She, she went to wh wherever there was somebody teaching, she studied. And that was the most interesting part of her. She never, she never said, I've got it. She, I, I, don't have to, I don't have to seek anymore. And that was an extraordinary uh, part of my mother. And you and, feel that in the lectures that are so broad yeah. in terms of, so talk about, I'm just rereading the section on Golden Boy today because of the recent oh. revival. Mm -hmm. And it, it, if you read the Golden Boy section, you learn about America in the 30s, you learn about immigrants, you learn about it's art, incredible. you learn it's about incredible. acting. The, the range of her comments is extraordinary. A hardcore academic would say, she's, she's not telling us what we need to know about the play. 
No, she's telling us more than a hardcore but academic But you know, she lived us. with Harold Clerman, and he was an enormous mind. And they, what they had, they were not a happy couple, and they, but they were married for a number of years. But they had the same intense understanding of the theater. And that was, or any play they would go to see, they went to, they went to the Soviet Union because everybody knew that that Russian acting was, you know, extraordinary. They went to Paris to get the study. And she went on studying all her life. Um, the last was studying with Maya Shapiro at Columbia University, painting the art, you know. And when we would go to Europe, she was in every museum. She knew every single place, everything. She studied and she studied. And her mind remained, no matter what it was in, in, in her personal life, her mind remained completely interested, engaged. engaged. But you know, in this, in the clips that I put together, you're going to see a couple of interesting things. First of all, at one point, or actually twice, she refers to this, which was I thought was very evolved of her. But I think it was true of her, where she talks about she says, "All right, enough with this feminine thinking. You know, you have to play. You know, enough with that. You know." And she would talk about the third sex, which is I think how she saw herself. And um, that if she wasn't confined to the way a woman was supposed to think and behave. Though she was deeply feminine. Yeah, she was. But it, I think it's exactly what Ellen's saying. It's an amalgam for her time of being beautiful and having this brain and having this curiosity and not being confined to a, f a feminine or female role. She, she did, uh, and she certainly did, I think Brando, many people who studied with her said that she taught not just theater, I have a quote she taught it. history. Stella and Adler was considerably more than a teacher of acting. Through her work she imparted, this is Brando, she imparted a valuable, a valuable kind of information, how to uncover the nature of our, of our own emotional me mechanics and therefore those of others. As far as I know, she is the only American artist who went to Paris to study with Konstantin Stanislavski, Stanislavski. and he, he himself was a skilled observer of human behavior and, and the most prominent figure in the Russian theater. She brought back to this country, this is Marlon writing this, a knowledge of his technique and incorporated it in, in, in her teaching. Little did she know that her teachings would impact the theater, the theatrical culture uh, worldwide. Almost all filmmaking anywhere in the world has been affected by American films, which have been in terms influenced by Stella Adler's teaching. She, she is loved by many. As an actor, we owe her much. I am grateful to the in his, in his, uh, contribution she has made to my life, and I feel a privilege to be, have been associated with her, her family professionally and personally throughout my life. That's Brando. But she, she taught him. And he, he was he, he, he was uh, he was from Nebraska and he couldn't do anything, you know. But he did wind up. He was an elevator boy and he wound up in the class. Uh, he was like uh, in this class, which which was at the new school. And she she worked with him and she opened him up. But he was amazing. She's had to, one of the exercises was to pretend you were chickens. So everybody's going oh, 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 in the class. And he was sitting very quietly, very, very quiet. She said, what are you doing? He said, I'm laying an egg. <laughs> <laughs> so, Barry, as, as an editor, Barry, I was interested. <laughs> uh, on what basis did you choose the plays? Because she spoke about so many plays. So many. And you, ch you do choose some, as you say, not the top 40. Yes. Well, it was tough because uh, she was alive and well, well, not very well, but she was alive and we had discussed the first volume that it was clear it was her and my joint decision that we do Ibsen, Strindberg, and Chekhov. Yeah. Ibsen being her favorite, Chekhov being my favorite. Strindberg being nobody's favorite, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Well, he was from the north. Yeah, but he was important. Uh, but with she was gone and we had I planned on discussing with her which American play. To answer your question more succinctly, uh, I ended up doing it with Vicky's collaboration and consultation. Uh, pretty much, I let her decide, Stella that is, on the basis of, of whom she spoke the most about and which plays she Odette. talked the most about. Odette's. Um, Odette's. Odette's, of course, was 
uh, top of well, we, we in, to do it chronologically, we had to do O'Neill. It sounds a little, um, it was a bit obligatory. In, in the beginning, he was the toughest, and he, he is the toughest yeah. for me personally. He's the least compelling, although I think the section on Morning Becomes Electra is astonishing. I think it's brilliant. It's a little tough going through beyond the horizon and there's, but anyway, so we had to do O'Neill and she, and she, you know, the most important beginning of the century. And then it was an easy, easy choice of uh, Odette's because she was the most uh, friendly with him and had worked with him well, and all of his, pardon? He was in the group. He was in the group, a uh, crucial member of the group. Yeah. It's interesting, and uh, Golden Boy is the only one of those plays, uh, the only one of any plays in the book that, that I took out a whole scene from, and just to give people an example of what her line by line exegesis was, I think it's astounding. Yeah, yeah. There's also a big controversy going on now in one of those wonderful blogs, the Talking Broadway thing. There's a guy who hated the book, hated Stella. Turns out he's oh, a Strasburg. Oh, I know. I, I saw that. I saw that. Something wrote something very nasty. Uh, yeah. It goes on and on. I, there was a, an entry, and I made the mistake of responding to it. Well, not the mistake, but my response yeah, that was about a, a five hundred. Definitely. <laughs> well, yeah. Now I know. I, I wrote about a five hundred word response, and he wrote a five thousand word response. <laughs> that was amazing. Anyway, you'll, you'll, it turns out I think to be good because you know Stella would have loved all that fussing and, and fighting about, it. and it's a, an ongoing debate. But uh, Odette's had to be there, and then of course Tennessee Williams, and. Um, the Thornton Wilder. Thornton Wilder is interesting. I the think problem so. is that we want, I want, I was hoping that there would be a section, I mean, that there would be a lot of material on our town, and she didn't talk about it. With the with great play. Great play. Story and she would have had, I don't know why she didn't yeah. pick it. Maybe it didn't lend itself to the kind, it, it's more of an ensemble piece, whereas many of the, Story most Mary. of the plays she chooses tend to be showcases mm -hmm. for the a more kind of a traditional protagonist. Uh, I don't know why, but and the same with Saroy, and I expected uh, time of your life. And there's, uh, to my knowledge, there's not even a maybe. There may be one five-page. Nothing. No, there's like a two-page, two or three-page, one little lecture on that, but not enough to even make a chapter. But there's this astonishing huge amount of material on this play that nobody knows called Hello Out There. Oh, yeah. Which is, you know, it's a wonderful play. It's a tiny little play. It's a one act. Yeah. And it, it's um, not the play that you'd choose if you were trying to find, or if you were picking Saroyan's greatest hits. That would and, be a slim tome, the, actually. The Williams and the Miller are both extraordinary. Pieces. Pardon? I said the Williams and the Miller pieces are both extraordinary. Oh, I, I think so too. Yeah, and then right, Miller was then the other one. Albie is very interesting that she would have been so fond of him and uh, Zeus' story. I think that's wonderful because that she could leap straight into an avant-garde, yes. different kind of theater. Totally but different. When when Edward uh, it shows her. when he first Zeus' story, I think it was first done in Germany or something, and it was completely different, completely different, and she came really. Her openness to this, it. Through, it was wonderful, and she came from really real, realism. That was the thing in the theater at that time. Barry, yeah. what did you decide you needed to translate for us? The, the footnotes. The footnotes. Every every Yiddish word you felt you had to translate. <laughs> I did a lot. Of, I did a lot. I don't know why. I didn't do you know like shlomiel like the easy. We know I, that. I did shmagaga. Shmagaga is one of my favorites. <laughs> she said he's no shmagaga. What is that? And my father was, I mean, I grew up with a lot of Yiddish. I never heard of Shmagaga. It's uh, like a, he's no pipe. I always thought it was a Shmagagi. 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 You know, we had a very well, big... What do you expect? He's from Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> a half Jew, half Catholic from Kansas. Oh, I have all sorts of issues. Um, yeah. <laughs> heavy, on the, heavy on the Catholics. In theory, we should be going to questions from the audience. And if you've got really urgent <laughs> questions, ask them. But this is great stuff. So if you don't have urgent questions, I'm just as happy to letting them talk. As you want. <laughs> what do you think? Ramble. Very encouraging. Urgent question? <laughs> no. Okay, keep going. <laughs> but we, we we end with giving Stella the last word. Nobody can go after Stella. No, nobody ever did. Assembled uh, about a half hour yeah. of fascinating material. We're talking about her as a. 
teacher, as a presence, that we should really give them a sense of her entrance into the classroom, well, the throne-like chair. I just want to say, thing, I wanted to say it? add yeah. one thing to it, is that she was the head of a family. It was a big family. Everybody was in the theater, and Stella was the head of the family. And she believed in family with such passion and such idealism. I mean, I, I have things that she's written. Family is the most important thing. And it was very moving, that, that sort of sense. And of course, everything happened. No matter what happened, it all happened at Stella's house. Uh, mm -hmm. If somebody died, and then we went there afterwards. If somebody got married, we went to Stella's. And she had this thing about family. I should have brought it. It's really something. Well, she also had all these playwrights would come to the house, too, for, uh, oh, well, that we you had, know, we had, well, that for was, events. That, well, that was Harold, you know, too. Harold, too. Well, my favorite of those stories is the, the night she says she was trying to point out the difference between Thornton Wilder's personality and Arthur Miller's. And she oh. said, you know, Thornton Wilder, he was amazing. He was like a, a clown. He was this great intellectual. He was in two, three Pulitzers. He went, but he was also a clown. He would like, make Faye would wear funny hats. He would entertain. Every would come in. Every the room yeah. would light up. Boston. Everybody had loved me. Said I had a party once, and he was doing. And I also invited Arthur Miller, and he came in. He said, "She said it was like death walked in the door." I said to the maid, "For God's sake, ask him to leave." <laughs> She just had a, f and the, her story's about Saroyan Arthur, when, the Arthur, when Arthur married Marilyn Monroe, which of course was the biggest shock of the theater community, <laughs> such a thing. But anyway, he was married to somebody, and they lived in Brooklyn Heights or something, and he left, and his wife at the time said, because he was such a heavy, heavy, a heavy passenger, his wife said, go, Arthur, go. <laughs> go with your life, go. Have a wonderful time, Arthur, go. <laughs> Let's see, also, when he enters the room, when he leaves the room, you feel like somebody just came in. He's right? awfully nice. <laughs> but you, Barry, you don't have her talking to students individually very much in the book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of her lectures were very focus to her students. Well, they one all were, but unfortunately, the transcripts, very few, believe me, this was a, a, a dearth of material that I always, that I kept lamenting as I was going through. Very, very few of the transcripts contain, of all those 3,000 pages, very few contained the students' interaction, the students' line. Whoever did them, and they, you know, was told, just do Stella. <laughs> and, uh, well, although for that matter, she didn't encourage a whole lot of students. Interaction. She didn't. Uh, she wasn't the kind of person who liked to. Uh, the kind of teacher that wanted to. She also to. preferred the boys. She preferred the boys. Definitely. That was very clear. This was her part of her problem with. I th with absolute, I'm absolutely All certain with Kyra Sedgwick. She um, she took a real disliking to her. Now Kyra also was annoying, and you could see why in a way. But she took an immediate dislike to her, and she said she has uh, in this one. And this is on video, which is amazing. Right? One of the video thing, most of the stuff I had was audio tape, but on the video, Kyra does a scene, and she really doesn't seem to be that bad or anything, but Stella hates it and, and says, it's, it's all about you and this blondness. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this incredible blondness of you. And, and Kyra Cedric makes the mistake of defending herself, saying Hello. something in return, and then that's when Stella made the famous, uh, that, darling, one of us is going to win, which one do you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> but it's chilling, it's a chilling moment. But there were, there were very few exchanges like that, but my favorite of them all is in the first book. But I just happened to bring it with me, because I hope you would ask me that question. <laughs> and if you bear with me one second, it's worth the wait. It's from the an Ibsen chapter. Uh, let me, while you're shuffling, let me, from my own experience, yes. when I would see her classes, and if a student was showing a deficient imagination, she would, the, her standard put down was, Everything is Hoboken to you. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't bring you and Hoboken in. But you know, as she got older, she got she was kinder to the to the females in the class. Yeah, she wasn't as hard on the girls. She wasn't. No, and there, I forgot this one um, fabulous clip 
uh, come to the next event and you'll see it, where this young man is doing a scene, I can't remember if it's Hamlet, but he's a king and he's wearing a house dress that's supposed to be a sort of medieval piece of clothing. And he's doing the scene and she interrupts and she says, talks to him and then she says, if you came to the theater dressed like that, you would be asked to leave. <laughs> Where did you get that? And he makes the mistake of saying, I stole it. <laughs> and everybody in the class laughs. And you see this sort of smile uh, cross her face. And then she gets serious and starts pounding the desk and saying, you talking about how, you know, what an actor's responsibility is. And um, the, the young man was Mark Ruffalo. Oh. <laughs> and he never forgot it. Because he I've certainly had, didn't. No. He certainly Whoa. didn't. He's a fantastic actor. I've had emails with yeah. him, and he has <laughs> talked about Beautiful that. Beautiful actor. Ooh, wish I'd have had that, Annie. Mm -hmm. But you know what Lee and Stella had in common for all their differences? They made actors feel important. They thought acting really counted in the world. And they made people studying acting feel as if they were in pursuit of some higher truth. Yeah. They, they both gave great dignity to the profession. There's no question. There's no doubt about that. Well, well Marlon said good. a great thing about Lee Strasberg. I'm going to give it all to you. He said, never talk about Lee Strasberg unless you talk about his post-nasal drip. <laughs> 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 because he used to say, and now we're going to <laughs> <laughs> And that was the thing. Uh, Brando Creek, because Lee claimed that Marlon had studied with him, which he never did. But of course, he, he got that way, Lee. He, he got interested in stardom and everything. Anyway, the post-nasal <laughs> So that was that. Well, she, uh, the day he died, the famous anecdote. Yeah, yeah, maybe you've already yeah, talked about that. Well, this is one of the very few anecdotes, uh, I mean, exchanges with the students in the first volume. There's, there are more in the second, because there were more in the, in the American plays, but, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, make, I'll condense it here, but she's, she's ranting and raving about enemy of the people, the Ibsen play, and how they're not, you know, the students are just too lazy, they're not doing the research, they're not doing any, you know, come in here and you think, all right, so she said, uh, you don't know, um, Enemy of the People is about a community, a liberal journalist, traditional housewife, a doctor. Uh, you don't know them. You have to find out about them. It's when? 1880. Where? The south of Norway. You don't know anything about the south of Norway. You think, I bet the south of Norway is like Tennessee. Well, it's not. Begin to find out about Norway. It's 20 miles where they are. It's 20 miles south of Oslo. Blah, blah, blah. Is it near the sea or the mountains? You have to know where you live so nobody can fool you. Um, you'd like to do that. You'd like to go to Mr. Strasberg, who says, ah. take everything you know about yourself and use it to make Oslo. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great line that, about the distinction between, or at least in her head, and I agree with her. But, uh, but you do not know Oslo. Um, you have to, unless you look up Oslo and find out you live in some dream world of Oslo that you can't use. If you do a uh, Russian play during the Napoleonic Revolution, it's a good thing to read Tolstoy. It cannot hurt you. Your whole thing is words. I say, leave them alone, for Christ's sake. Find something out about Oslo. She goes on and on. And finally, she says, and it ends up with, you can't travel inland. The mountains are 16,000 feet. Inquire about those mountains. Aren't you interested in anything? And then she pauses. And during her dramatic pause, an offended actor <laughs> in, this, in the class, makes the mistake of not just interrupting her, but challenging her. Uh -uh. And he said, uh, Miss Adler, we are here as professionals, and sometimes you address us as rank student. I'm sorry to have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and she, there's this pause, and she said, listen, I'll tell you what we'll do. You don't say anything rotten about me, and I won't say anything rotten about you. I'm talking to you as a professional, even though I don't think there's such a thing as a professional in America. Now, how do you like that? And the student says, well, I classify somebody who owes his livelihood to act. She interrupts, and she says, we're in Ibsenian dialectics. You have your truth, I have mine. Mm -hmm. I'm treating you like students because you need this work. I don't want to treat professionals like students. I don't want to treat students like professionals. But I'm going to treat you the way I feel like treating you. And one of the things I want to say is I don't have much respect for your ability to call yourself a professional. It means something 
else to you than it means to me. It doesn't mean belonging to equity. It doesn't mean having jobs. When I'm acting and involved with the snow and Oslo, I don't give a goddamn about it. <laughs> I'm involved with acting, with the play, with different snow. These are different. If you want polite people, go to England. I'll introduce you to them. They'll be, very nice. They'll be very nice to you, but I'm a pretty important teacher. There's nobody giving this class better than I, than I in America, and you're stuck with me, so you'd better take what's good about me and shut up about the rest. <laughs> and that's why there aren't a lot of student interactions. <laughs> and that's probably a, good a couple segue. of those, yeah. boy, and there weren't a lot of students that wanted to subject themselves to uh, She became a teacher because because the, uh, there were no parts. She, had, uh, she was tall and she was Jewish with, at that time, so she had to change her name and name Adler. America was before the Holocaust and before Germany. This was a fairly anti-Semitic country. You had to, there were quotas for colleges and all kinds of things way back, and that all changed. But uh, in Hollywood, didn't she have to become Ardler? And to, for the movie, they put an R in there, Ardler. <laughs> And, and since I that think, made it yeah. <laughs> Gentile, that immediately took the Jewishness out of it and made it. Of course, in those days, one did expect to go to Hollywood and make movies. And she made a couple of movies, and she went out there, but that, it didn't work. She, she didn't have the right, some, something was not what she was, who she was, and her beauty was not what it was, it was complicated. So she came back, and that's when she went to the new school and started to teach it was Irwin Piscott, and she started to teach. And I think she would have had a very hard life being an actress, because everybody does. And in the teaching, she, the whole entire intellectual you know, gold mine opened up of who she really was. And it was very fortunate that that happened. Because kicking around and trying to get a job in the theater, there's somebody, somebody does the thing with looking, I forgot who it was. You go to the theater, and, and the theater is dark, uh, uh, an actor auditioning. So he's, the playwright, the director, and the producer are sitting in the row, and the house is dark, and the actor comes in. I'm just going to use this as an example. And he says, one in charge is next. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can be replaced. It's very yeah. tough out there. Well, and she had been, I mean, she had been a, a professional actor since she was three years old. She'd, she'd done that, been there, done that for her entire life and she childhood. She did that and she worked all through the group, but he gave her uh, Jewish uh, older women, wasn't too happy. But that. she brought that into the class. She was the great teacher as the great actress. Oh yeah, definitely. There, the two roles were one. She definitely, I mean, every class was, uh, back to your point of a while ago, she, every class was a performer. Yeah. You know, it was a performer. I mean, and she even to the point of requiring Applause. And there's one. Well, one you're going to see yeah. when, when, and the clips that were that I'm, I put together. Hey, could I ask a question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm from India. I'm an actor. I used to be a lawyer, an actor. Uh, when I read first volume, some of the things when I read, uh, when she was talking about Ibsen, when I was in hunger strike in 82, 83. Exactly the same words my friends were telling me to politicize me. And word for word, uh, it just like my friends were speaking to me. She spoke to me. Mm. So I couldn't stop reading it. I spent a whole week reading it, finished the book. Uh, so it kind of made me curious what who is this person? Uh, this is the person I would like to study with. But she did. Um, the reason I'm asking is, in the Ibsen, and my friends told me, <coughs> Rao, family is an economic institution. Institutions suppress freedom. So the question I'm asking you is, uh, some of the problems she had, uh, family, children, whatever, how hard it is with the having. Is it all coming from the uh, intellectual genius of this Ibsen where she thinks it's the family, it's an economic institution, the institution suppress freedom. So is she kind of uh, deal with this intellectuality, with the reality of being a mother, whatever? I'm just, I'm just curious. It affected me personally in my life, in my relationships. 
So, well, one thing my easy. mother was very anxious about was marriage. <laughs> and I have all kinds of things here, why I didn't get married. The last I saw of her, she said, she was six years out in Hollywood, and she said to me, you're very beautiful, Ellen, with her eyes. Dripping. She said, you always were. This is a mother speaking to the daughter, and you always will be, she said. I don't know, her last words, I don't know why you never married again. And then she said very quietly, maybe if you had done something better with your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Those were her last words. Well, yeah. she was a mother who was constantly changing and fixing and changing your hair. Maybe if you did. Yeah. <laughs> now I think we need, yeah, we need to. Uh, Vicki, tell us how you chose what we're going to be seeing. Well, I'll just give you the general shape of it. There are. Um, some funny clips, and then at the centerpiece of it is a, a sort of longish clip that's quite extraordinary, where you see Stella using her imagination to piece together how to think about a play and the middle class and the <laughs> setting. And you see her actually taking um, how, how she puts it together as a way to show students how to think about it. And then there, are, then the, there are amusing clips after, but of course they're always revealing. And the one thing to be aware of is the throne. Yeah. She sits in the chair. Now the chair in different clips. We put so, that there. Sometimes the chair gets as ratty as could be, but she is still sitting there like the queen. And despite the fact that the chair is sort of falling apart, she is still in possession of the kingdom. And uh, it's, it's amusing. It's amusing to watch how she transcends it all. So now, I don't know how to work this. So, Foster. But you're asking me, Mr. Oh, Technology. the screen is here. Yeah, I know. But I mean, I guess, the, is the power on? Or should I just press play? Yeah, just press play. Just press play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's so easy. Where the hell is it? Okay. I have to move. Okay. So if we want to turn off the yeah. lights, get, or down the lights a little bit, or if not, just still good. Okay. Oh my God. I am not. Oh my God. I'm telling the whole world. I'm not a player. Oh. I don't play to lunch. I don't chat. One of the great political statements oh, that Stella right. ever made at that time was when she said, well, of course, I could live in any communist country, providing I was the queen. <laughs> 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 In 1937, Hollywood called, and Stella answered, to a new last name, Artler. I had this long controversy with them, and at last, I remember, I said, well, if I can pronounce it, you can spell it any way you like. Hello, boys, and thank you. Oh. Miss Craven, I don't know of anyone I am so happy to see. How's that darling little dog of yours, Miss Prinny? He's a darling, isn't oh, he's he? Cute. Now, could you say hello to Sam for me? Not only hello, but Skull, Prosit, and Harley. <laughs> oh, thank you. How grand it is to see you looking so well. You mustn't believe everything you see, Mr. Jonathan. <laughs> this is a great pleasure, Linda. Pleasure's all mine, Buzzy. Be seated, gentlemen, and just relax. I don't think I can help you. You see, I hardly knew Mr. Barrow. Oh. Well, you didn't miss much. He wasn't exactly one of the nature's noblemen. Really? Oh. Well, how nice. Oh. A comedian doesn't have any fragrance. He doesn't need any around you. I'm glad you like my perfume. She was a lady to start with. You know, you're very, very elegant. Nice. And then she turns around and she really, really shows the worst side of her, which is a gun mall, and she's a dirty word. And I like that twist in it. Why the detour? None of your business. I'm not on trial. Not yet. That's what I deserve for letting a double-crossing cop in the door. Get out. Uh, Get out. 
Thanks for the camellia. And don't come back. Don't look now, but your accent's showing. How many people are on the TV? The gasoline is rationed as of tonight. How many people say, oh, God, yes? Hmm? Yes? You have no real power over government if you have this revolution. Now, they don't want to create a revolution. They want simply to have change. I just want you to get through to the 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 uh, the situation of the middle class in relation to uh, what what I call the social situation. You cannot play him if you uh, if you read the play and know you don't know that you can't play him unless you know what I've told you. That we are gra gradually, without your knowing it, we are getting to his character. Yes or no? Yeah. In relation to his ethic, if he belongs to a bank and the bank situation is utterly conservative in that time, then you would realize that his ethic is absolutely without any leeway. Now, the middle class had always the ethic of honesty and morality. Uh, honesty and morality. And uh, a lot of it early came from God. And God told you and he gave you the Ten Commandments and he gave you what is needed to be honest in your society. Now, with the with these changes from God, the institutions took over the moral questions. So the institutions, the church, and the bank would say oh, they wouldn't marry anybody that uh, had any suspicion. I don't think they still would in hi hire somebody that had a uh, was arrested for something. Don't yawn, darling. Don't yawn. If you're an actress, you will not get tired. If you're a pishika, you'll get tired. <laughs> because you'll say, well, what is she saying? I don't understand half of what she's saying because I don't know, I only know me. <laughs> so anybody else doesn't interest you very much. Well, it so happens there is no you when you're an actor. You're only the character, only. And if you'll give up that you, 
I shouldn't say that because I look as if there's a lot of me. <laughs> There is no me, believe me. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now, I'd be the most ignorant person in the world if it wasn't for a character that I have to study. I know so much about Norway, I can't tell you. <laughs> I know the whole thing about Norway. I think I'll just give this up and talk about Norway. <laughs> I am Norwegian, you know. He doesn't want to, what's the dirty word, but he doesn't want to, well, you know, I'd like to talk to you about something. I want to ask you a straight question. Where have I heard that before? I want to ask you straight. That kind of a, a examination law, my memory is, I, listen, I've got to ask you a straight question. That has a, a husband doesn't talk like that. Your friends don't talk to that. Who talks like that? I don't know, but it's puzzling. Who understands? Yeah. Puzzling. Then you are there with a couple of puzzles. That's the beginning of saying, what are impressions? Who understands? Yeah. They have nothing to do with what somebody told you about the play. Some of these impressions are right and some of them are wrong. But at least you are not pushing the play. You are not forcing this particular type of uh, literature. You are not putting into this t typical type of literature called the play form, the modern play form. You are not allowed to push it. It is a skeleton. And you have to discover where the bones go. It has no bones, it has no flesh. You have to take it upon yourself to say, this skeleton needs me. It needs the histrionic side of literature. And so forever you must say, the play is theater, a theater piece. And a theater piece is not literature. It is a, a play. Therefore, if you play the literature, and leave out the actor, you are doing something that doesn't belong to the theater. The theater has a balance. In the middle is the theater. On one side is the actor, that's the histrionic side. On the other side is the words, that's the literary side. Nobody goes in and, sa and says, oh, I'm dying to read that play. Sweetheart, go down and ru uh, run, run down and get me uh, dinner at eight. You don't talk like that about a play. It's a phony thing when you go into a house and they have a lot of plays. They don't read plays. It, it's one of the most ghastly things to do. How are you? Fine. When did you arrive? Ask him. Ask him. It's not a play. It is a form that needs the th actor. Now, if you leave out the contribution of the actor, then there is no play because it's nothing, it's words not making sense. If you push it, you'll make some crazy sense out of it. But therefore, you are not contributing anything to the words. Therefore, you have to understand that it is the histrionic side, remember that. Historically, histrionic means the acting side of a play. And you must use the play, you must use it like an ingredient for yourself. It's an ingredient that you use for the uh, his, uh, histrionic side of you. And then somebody says, it's theater. Am I clear? Yeah, yeah. But these two forms have to get together. Now, this underlining the past of the play and getting your impressions the way I did is your first job when you get a text that's a play. Get the impressions, then go over them. Now, I'm going to take the time a little bit to go over them, shall I? Uh, 
excuse me, Mrs. Helma. I don't know that name. It's not used very often in America or London or Paris. And it gives me no memory. So, I have very little knowledge of the, of people who are called Krogstadt and no memory at all. I can't search for it. I've never met that before. I wonder where this is taking place. Who understands? wonder where this is taking place. Uh, what do you want? I beg your pardon. It is polite. Somebody's very polite. Someone must have forgotten to close the door. That gives it already a closed-in quality. Uh, it's inside. It isn't in a garden. It isn't a palace. It seems to get a little closer. We say close the door. It gets closer already that it isn't uh, too far away. I begin to see apartments with doors. I begin to see uh, a front door. I begin to see stoops and a front door and doors and apartments. But I don't feel elevator. Somebody must have forgotten to close the door. Is already uh, steps. It's not, I, I'm riding up in an elevator. So I have to work to see something about walking up steps. Or I, I already am not in elevator, Bill. I'm not with us. Who understands? This is very good, isn't it, to know that somebody, to get somewhere, has to walk up some steps. People do not live on the ground floor. Then it begins to say, yes, people live. The, the best apartment in Italian is called the Piano Nobile. That's on the second floor. And the servants, so I have to get to myself, you know? Uh, I have to use what I have. Now, the second floor is the best floor. The third floor is next to the best. I'm beginning to contribute that the ground floor is used for the concierge, yes, always. People do not live in the ground floor. So this home must be either second or third floor, no elevator. And now I begin to think of Dickens and... Uh, houses, and I begin to see houses that are made uh, for family houses with three, four stories, and uh, I, I, yes, there's always a street, and then you go up, and then somebody has a window, and you say, what floor is so-and-so on? Yes, 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 yes. It's another time, and, uh, and you have to bring in yourself. Who understands? Yeah. I don't know. The well, one thing you mustn't do is say, it's a door, it's like my door. Now, the moment I say it's not like my door, I begin to see that there's the bolt is made differently, very differently that everything you see in a country like England or France is made with the hand in it. It, is, it, it has its special, uh, that it's made for time, that it has more weight. Uh, and a European door has more weight than our doors. It's bolted in its own weight. Uh, uh, yes, my, 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 my travels make me understand, oh, God, yes. When I was first taken to, this all happens. When I was first taken to Europe and I was on the boat and I arrived in London, oh, I said, no, it's not like that. 
It's, I mean, that's like New York. They have steps. And people live in houses. I didn't know what Europe, I thought they might live in cities. But I remember the shock I had that in some way, people lived in houses like they do in America. So the next thing is that my first impression was that it wasn't like our houses. Our houses were, uh, they were apartment houses, but these are all houses like this. And I begin to see that they're family houses and that they have a structure of middle class life. I think, I think this is like that. I don't know, but I think so. But I get there from me and the strange names and Krogstadt. I get to London. I get to see that a house has stoops and that they, and the bolt on the door was very shocking to me. And the bolt on every French door is shocking because it's so beautiful. It's so big. And the doors mean something. I've got something, Stella Adler. I've got something. This is a strong middle class. This is a strong middle class. The doors are strong. They must be. Look how I've arrived at the essence of this play, the depth of the middle class of this play. Yes or no? Do you understand that I understand from my whole life what I need from my life? I have drawn to create the play, and I don't have to go inside here. <laughs> it's about Nora. No. <laughs> it's about a strong middle class. I've got my hand on it, and therefore, Everything about it has a power. The middle class has power. And I begin to say, what is the power in the middle class? The institutions around it. The middle class is a middle class created by the institutions. And my first comes they know how to make money, and they use money. And there's a family, and there's always a church, and there's always a city hall, and there's always a police, and there's always a, a park, and, and people. I know, I know, I know so much about the structure around the class. And then I know I have to deal with every structure because that's what you're learning. How the people think through these structures. What is their relation to money? What is their relation to religion? What is their relation to education, to the church, to the police? And you have to know this. If not, you don't know how you're living. But your character has to live by these uh, institutional things. That's what makes the middle class. Don't apply it to Hamlet. But if you get the middle class, 19th century middle class, 18th century middle class, you will have to know that it is transitional into the strongest class that is there. On top of this class, you can put the English queen. On top of this class, you can put the uh, the Danish uh, royalty, but you cannot say that it is a class, it's about royalty. You understand? You just feel the bolt on that door makes you know that you walk up, that it's not a palace, and that this power, the strength, that it's, it's repeated. I know it's repeated, I've seen it repeated, in, and, and now the repetition means to me that when you see a thing repeated, it is the dominant class of those people. Back home, 
she brought her passion for people, for life, and for the theater into the classroom. In 1949, she opened an acting studio, which continues today. Okay. It's a lively applause, but I don't trust it. Uh, I think because it's raining, uh, you might be a little bit uh, protected by scarves and sweaters, and so let's scream. Ah! There is a very good story around that a long time ago that I went into uh, Tiffany and bought some, you know that story? Yes, it's, it's a very good story. And I uh, bought something and the lady said, uh, oh, where shall we send it in England? I said, uh, oh, I don't live in England. She said, I, I, I thought you were English. I said, no, just affected. <laughs> Come here, darling. Stay there. Speak to her and make her realize the technique of being a queen. Now you are speaking to her without uh, guiding her, aw awakening her to this technique of governing, which is masculine, which is strong, which is, don't, uh, da, 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 it's not going to help you. Uh, she says, I too. Now, what you must realize is that every queen is brought up, educated to rule. They are not educated to be girls. You will never govern, Mary. You'll never govern, Mary! <laughs> if you want my love, you shall have it freely when I am free. You will never govern, Mary. If I let you go back to Scotland, there will be long broils again, dangers and right ones to my peace and... More! To be fair to my own people, this must not be. Colors, but colors, I'm lots of colors. Up and down and very loud. Now, darling, you must realize a star Elizabeth. She was a star. She was a queen. Now you're playing, you're playing the wa lady in waiting. There is no age for an actress. There is no age. You have to have it. You have to be able to produce it. You have to have that tone that you give her. You can't always do this. Because yeah, I'll kill you. So what's the good of it? And who will rule in my place? Why, who rules now? Your brother. He rules my son. Yes, but all this could be arranged, or so I'm told, if your son will crown king, and Moray made regent. All right, every one of her arguments is stupid. Stupid. Right. Walk away from her. Stupid. You're stupid. You'll do as I say. You don't always have to face her. You'll do as I say. I want to stop with all this nonsense. Oh, well, now we have some more of this stupid uh, feminine thinking. Finished with that. I was standing still because I felt more powerful standing in one place than moving around. I felt like a... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. She's like, I have fun of my piano teacher. And I'm playing da, 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 di. Say, faster, faster. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I, 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 I can't go so fast. Just a moment, stop coughing, no actor coughs, they don't sneeze and they don't, uh, they don't catch colds. They're not tired, they don't yawn and they don't chew gum. <laughs> so, I told you in the beginning that no matter what I said, 
you wouldn't listen. You would go to the words. You are drunk with words. With, you are infected. You are diseased with words. Instead of what words come from. You must contribute to the words. The words are not your privilege. The words are somebody else's. You must do something with them. You must give them life. They are on the page. Shakespeare is dead as doornails on the page. The play has nothing to do with words. Nothing at all to do with words. First of all, I would advise you immediately to take yourself out of any book. I may refer to myself as a little example. Take yourself away. Look to that moment. Look at the men that he's dealing with. He's dealing with Nietzsche, darling, not with some goddamn foolish woman there that's telling you you've got to be programmed. He's dealing with people like that. He's dealing like people with Swedenborg. He's dealing with people that understand him and their problems that are your problem. He, but he's, these are the big people that are understanding it. I don't level with them. Don't level with these people. See what they have to say. For Christ's sake, don't bring everybody down to our level. You have been abandoned mostly. Absolutely abandoned in every way. Now we are trying to get some point of view so you can act the man someday. You can act the woman who's in conflict. And you have no, there's no way to make you act except pissy caca business. I don't like this and I don't like it. You've got to stop it. We are with the great men. It's, uh, Mr. O'Neill said, I want everything of Nietzsche, of, of Strindberg published. I will pay for everything. Mr. Mr. Shaw, uh, Mr. Shaw did that, and Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill gave him the, the, the Nobel Prize. Now, all these people are the playwrights you're going to deal with. We're not going to deal with the programmed lady. Get yourself away. Let us deal with you as material, not as evolved people. You are material. Mostly, I can play this play, I can play that play, I can understand that man and this man. One thing I don't want to understand is Stella all day long when she's doing this and that. I don't need her. I need her in two and a half hours when she's concentrated as a third sex, or she is defeated, or she is a woman that wants to become like Nora or so, wants to become like something. I don't need this Stella. Do you understand? Material, a blackboard. People write on me, yes? That's what you are. Will you stop it with yourself? I don't know if I told you, and maybe it's wrong to say it. When a guy said to me, I'm, well, I'm a guy like Hamlet. I said, I don't think so. I said, Hamlet owned Denmark. <laughs> and you don't have a pot to piss in. <laughs> Thank you.